and this as well. And if that slows it down or not. So it's quite interesting all the options that you have. It's unbelievably complicated all the streaming options. Gone with defaults most of the time. Uh, and what I'm not sure about is Twitch gives you an option to record, but it's not specific about it, and it says it only keeps it so many days. So I've got to check out what happens with that and whether I should do local uh, recordings as well. Um, the only thing that worries me about the local recording is he added... Uh, processing. But looking at my numbers here, it actually looks pretty good. Yeah, own your own data. Quite right, Ed. Um, currently, CPU is about 15 or 16 percent, which is pretty good, and it's claiming 60 frames per second. Uh, it's also claiming 2.6 gigabit speed. So I don't know what that nonsense before was about. It's been averaging at 2.4, 2.5, 2.6, which is more like what I'd normally get. So that's kind of weird. Just one of those gremlins. <laughs> Typical. Oh, I've got to bring up my post-its as well with my notes because I lost that after the restart. Of course, when I run the CAD a bit later, it's probably going to hammer the CPU. Uh, I'm running on my laptop as well. Um, the only thing that that might cause a problem with is uh, the fan noise. I don't know if you can hear the fan, guys. I can hear it here, but I'm not going to say anything for a bit. Yeah, however, fan noise isn't normally a good thing, but uh, in this case, um, I tend to, the fan tends to engage um, quite a lot because this is a gaming laptop and it's got a GeForce RTX in it as well, so it kind of buzzes away when it's doing anything slightly stressful. <laughs> yeah it does go if i'm silent for a bit i think the, the noise cancelling actually downs the gain automatically so you don't even see a trace which is really interesting but when i'm talking of course you can i do have um I've got some lava mics, or well, I've got a really good stereo lava mic. It is unbelievably sensitive, though. These puppies, these are old analog ones as well, um, but they are incredibly sensitive. I'll probably be used that when I'm doing the hardware and that. I'll strap those on. For the moment, I'm avoiding them because I think the sound is going to be... They pick up everything. I mean, we can give it a go for a comparison. Hold on. It'd be interesting. I have to monitor these, though. Um, there will be a sec. Let me just change the settings. It's going to switch over. So I'm going to turn off the desk mic. And I'm going to put the lava mics on. So you'll probably notice a change. But yeah, being further from the fan um, may well help. Although these are so sensitive, um, it will still pick it up. The volume's higher now. That's these mics, they're really sensitive, mate. I don't know. 
Hold on, let me just uh, take that down just a tad. One, two, three, one. That should be a little bit better. Let's run with the lava mics for a bit, see how we get on. But they will pick up literally everything around and behind me. The other mic is a good mic, but it's, it's like a softer mic. It's got a more rounded sound. Whereas these lava mics are, it's, it's, it's like a very high sensitivity thing. Typing, well, you really will hear that clanging. Um, unfortunately, I forgot to put on my um, more silent. I've got my Corsair keyboard here and it's going to clank like hell. Um, let me give you an example of what it sounds like. Quite clanky. Is that better? Um, it should be better because it's not on the same desk. One of the problems I've got with the mic at the moment, it's not on a freestanding um, boom. It's on a metal stand, which I've got a soft piece of cloth underneath, but it is physically attached to the table. Um, there is a um, isolator on it, but it's not that good. But you think it's better, Ed? That's good. Nori, what do you think? Oh, I might get some company soon as well. One of the cats has just come in. Okay. I'll run with the lava mics for now. Um, let me just have a drink. So I'll just crack on anyhow. Sounds fine, but was louder with the previous mic. Oh, do you want me to turn the volume up a bit? I can do that, Nori. One, two, one, two. What about that? It's quite a bit louder now. I've got to be careful I don't redline it. What do you think, guys? You'll probably be able to pick up the keyboard again now. I must remember to change the keyboard next time to one of the silent ones. Although I'm not going to be typing an awful lot in this particular um, stream. I'm certainly not planning on doing so. Right, I'm going to get on. Careful not to shout, actually, because that is slightly louder. Let me just take it down, touch, see it redlining. So, um, what was I going to do first? Oh, um, the forum. Uh, I changed the colour scheme to a dark scheme. Um, I've actually got to do a lot more work on this, but I can't do it right now because I've got a problem with the updates uh, on the discourse server um, and I need to speak uh, to my web guy that set this up but I'd like to update it to a newer version um, there's a whole bunch of other stuff on the site that I need to get access to to make some changes Okay, that's good, Ed. Um, I am clueless on discourse at this point in time. Uh, I may dig in a bit deeper. But I need to um, just get the keys off someone because um, 
I need to just check some settings and things with them. But for some reason it's just not updating itself the way it should do. And it's driving me a bit nuts. So I've got that fun to come. So I'll have to change all of that soon. Uh, but until I, until I get hold of my guy, um, that's not going to be easy. So I'm just going to leave it for the moment. Okay, Ed. Ed's Big Ed. Couldn't you get Big Ed on, the, on Twitch? Someone already taken it. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, I try and use a consistent username across the various different um, platforms. It just makes it easier so people know who I am. Yeah, we'll keep in two identities. Well, this is my alternate identity, you see, Folknology. My virtual identity. <laughs> Bigger in some contexts. <laughs> right. Um, so the other thing I was going to talk about, Black Ice, um, you probably know if you've um, had the forum. Um, we've been out of stock for a little bit, but that's primarily down to um, do, 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 these, i.e. the carrier board. I've got the ice cores, but the carrier boards need populating and it's a bit of a pain because there are three lots of 30 connectors for the mix mods then there's a 26 ping connector as well and that all gets hand soldered by yours truly at the moment so uh, we've been uh, somewhat lacking in that front so I've got to catch up and do a few more of these now uh, try and get a few of those out next week um, and then put some stock back in and the other thing I've got is uh, the ice cores da -da, these although this one's got some connectors in the back um, I've got quite a few of these allocated to um, a university in South America and I'm just waiting for them to get back to me because they use it for a course. They've been using it for a course for a while, but they're ordering enough for their next is it semester courses. Um, because of the virus, um, they want their students to be able to have these at home. Whereas before they'd all go into, you know, the labs, etc. and use their really expensive FPGA kit. But the uh, university decided was basically have one per student and they can afford to do that with the black ice MX. So I put a few of those, quite a few of those aside for those guys. So I'm not exactly sure how many I've got left. I've got to do a count up and I've got a few that I've got to uh, just rectify some uh, uh, flash issues with that I haven't flashed properly yet. So I've got to try and work out where I am with those um, over the next couple of weeks and get the daughterboard solders and then get those back in stock for people. So um, the Black Edge uh, board, I kind of tore up the design I had. Um, and I've been making some changes on that. I'm not going to cover that today, um, but there will be some differences with that. I'm going to stick to the black edge design. 
So we're still going to use the Black Edge connector system. Uh, the pins on Black Edge will change slightly, but they should all be backward compatible with what we've already done on the ice core. Um, but on the the next core, if you like, the ECP5 version, we're going to try and use up all of those pins. So I've been trying to work out the best way of doing that. Um, I'm working out what the best usage of those pins are. Um, the mixed mod standards are also going to have a slight change. Before, on the ADCs, we had uh, five ADC pins in the center, as well as the five volts. I'm changing that, so it's going to be four ADC pins and five volt and ground. Uh, the reason for doing that is lots of people were using five volt and ground in the center. Um, they were using it unofficially with double P mods or quad P mods if you like. Um, and they were always putting that pair together so uh, it seems sensible that I adopt that same practice and then at least what I'm doing is compatible with what they're doing. I know they're not putting the analog pins in between um, but I want to just make that relatively small change um, on the mix mods. So I'm going to update that standard. Um, on the black ice front the other thing I've done is I've um, actually created, been working away with um, NMIGEN and experimenting with that on black ice. So I've got a couple of NMIGEN files, one for ice core and one for black ice. So I'm going to add those to the repo as well soon. I've had a bit of fun with that over the summer. Um, I'll come back to the ECP5 stuff and the next core on a later stream because I've still got a, a lot of things to do on that front. Um, but one of the things that I am going to talk about and work on a little bit this evening is the um, a new lower cost board. I've been working on. Um, I think NMIGEN Laurie is um, looking really good. I've had um, some very good experiences with it and can see some interesting potentials. I know that there isn't quite a Litex with it yet but there are there are lots of people working on it and doing equivalent things, including SOCs among others. Um, I'm quite impressed with how NMIGEN works. Um, so I'm going to pursue that a bit more and uh, although I'm not going to do much on it this current stream, I want to actually spend some time streaming using NMIGEN a bit later. Um, you know, in a few weeks' time, probably it's going to become essential. Um, I don't know if you remember the conversations I had on the forum in terms of the plans. Let's see if I can lift my chair up here a little. Better. But one of the things that I talked about is with. Yeah, I mean, Litex does still use MyGen. I think we'll probably see something. I'm not entirely sure we're going to see Litex ported to end MyGen. I think we'll see something new emerging. Uh, there's quite a bit of excitement from a number of different people about building on top of end MyGen in ways that perhaps they couldn't with the MyGen. And they probably couldn't get, get above the noise floor compared to Litex anyhow. So it, it's a chance for new new um new structures on top and new ideas i think 
Um, but if we go back to what I talked about on the forum some time ago, um, you kind of had ice, black ice in the middle, and then you had um, uh, black edge or next core type black edge, ECP5 versions, and that's continuing. I'm going to get that out soon. But then there was a low end stuff as well. Uh, I think I call it my star or something. Um, if we think back to all the generations of black ice, um, if you remind me, Laurie, um, a bit later, I've got a section that I call graveyard. Uh, uh, and I might um, bring something up on the HDMI front there. Um, let me go through the, the newer stuff first, and then I'll circle back round to that. Um, there is a potential solution, but it's untested at this point. But I'll, I'll circle back round to that and see what you guys think. So when I talked about separating the design, so black ice itself is kind of in the middle, then you have this black edge at the top with the new next core type products, and then down below we have what I call the MyStar stuff. Um, I have probably designed about 20 different boards <laughs> trying to find something on the low end that I'm happy with and each time i get kind of three quarters of the way i fall out with the design and it just doesn't do it for me um if, if you go back to the way we started originally the board was actually called my storm uh, i probably got one but i'm not going to dig it out now because it's right down the bottom of the um bottom of my cardboard boxes under the table um it was only later that we came out with the black ice name or the renaming of the product uh, and then just used the kind of my storm as a kind of project stroke organizational labeling and then everything flowed on from black ice you know black ice to three four etc to where we are now and um that's all been based around the hx chipset uh, the big problem with the HX chipset is the lack of internal resources even though the um, the fabrics quite good speeds quite good the internal resources are fairly limited in terms of things like memory it doesn't have any DSP units that kind of thing so that's always been a problem the other thing is Beyond, if you go down below, say, the TQFP144 pin, which is what we used on Black Eyes, you really get into fairly rubbishy small numbers of gates. Uh, and you're not really saving a great deal of money by going down that route. And the pricing of the... Um, Ice HX, certainly for the larger, you know, 4K upwards, 8K chips. Frankly, you may as well go for uh, the lower end ECP fives. Um, I think if you're going for the HXs now, you're kind of um, making it difficult on yourself. It's easy to go for the ECP5. I mean, it does bring in some other issues in terms of the construction. You have to go to BGA, for example. You can't use any TQFPs or QFNs. So that kind of rules out its use in a lower cost design in many ways. So the other one that I was looking at um, was the LPs, uh, the low power ice 40s but again cost wise you're not getting that many gates you're not getting enough memory in most cases uh, and additional resources 
which kind of left me looking at um, the ultras, nice 40 ultras. And I've looked at those for quite a long time, um, purely with the ice 40, sorry, the ice ultra 5Ks. I've again been through about 10 different potential designs. And then recently I had a bit of a uh, a kind of um, I remembered one of the ideas that I had oh two or three years ago one of the things that I wanted to do with black ice but because of the way that we'd structured it um, and the features that we had on that um, we couldn't do exactly what we wanted or I couldn't do exactly what I wanted um, and that was to add in you know move away from the STM32 and actually use the expressive um, microcontrollers um, and the one thing that's really held me back from doing that is the lack of USB on the parts if you don't have the USB, then you have to add another chip to do the USB to UART conversion for you. So if you look at most of the expressive modules, etc., they all had, you know, CPC 2103s or not the FTDIs because they tend to be more expensive, but some form of normally a Chinese uh, USB UART conversion chip. Um, and we used those in the early days on the black ice and it just adds another part to the to the bill of materials and that's a problem because we're forever trying to actually reduce the number of parts on the bomb particularly if you want to go for the low end however um, as of late last year expressive had uh, talked about the new ESP32 S2 uh, I don't know how much you know about the history of the expressive chips. The first ones that were popularly found on modules. Um, let me see if I can dig one out here. Um, try not to run myself over with cables. Headphone and mic. I've probably got some up here actually. Thinking about it. Um, Where I put it, oh, oh, right, of course, at the back, at the bottom, as always. Doesn't matter which system you adopt, it's always the wrong one. Mm -hmm. Um, initial ones were the 8266 eight, chips. Uh, again, one of the big issues with the 8266 was that you had just a single ADC and no USB. So, of course, we couldn't really use that. They then improved that with the USB 32, uh, which is based on a 32 bit extensor processor. And they added some ADCs and you had the iRover among others and I had one of those kits and I played around with it for quite a bit and wondered if I could use that but again the missing USB and we had to add, had to add these other parts and, and that kind of killed me really in terms of the bomb and then with the advent late last year of the PS2 you now have um, a chip that's um, that's got USB built in. Uh, I've got a dev kit here actually, which is quite an interesting one. Um, pretty fancy stuff, comes with like a touchpad. 
In fact, this comes with all sorts of interesting bits and bobs. Fairly powerful. So it's even got like um, LCD, but it's like a layered, it's like a sandwich board. So it just sits one on top of the other. It's quite interesting. Um, and then at the end, if you look very carefully on the bottom, you'll see the uh, Rover chip, which is an ESP32. Can I get it to focus on? There we go. ESP32S2. Uh, the irony with this development board is it has the same programming CPC2103 as the old ESP32s. Incredibly stupid. And it's got two USB sockets. Burp. See on the end? two and they didn't think oh let's use one to put a, on the um connect to the internal usb oh so one of those is just power and the other one is connected to the to an ftdi chip to do the jtag for developing and etc however not everyone is that stupid and they do use the um um USB and I'm modifying this so basically that, so that the power power port um, enables me to use a USB as well just a couple of mob wires literally two mil long um, so I've got that uh, and the other thing I've been running with um, Dev kit wise for working on what I'm working on. Guess what? Yes, lettuce. But this is the uh, had this for a while. I've been using the um, so this is the up 5k dev board from lattice. Typical lattice trick. Let me see if I can get it focused closer, maybe. Didn't do well on this. Hold on. Because the light's reflecting on it from behind. There we go. Uh, but typical lattice, they put a million different, million different things on the board. Completely overkill, of course. But it's useful from a development perspective. So I'm hooking those two pieces together. Uh, which gives you a clue as to what I'm I'm building. So let me see if I can switch to that, and I can start showing you around. Yeah, the icebreaker is really good. That's Peter's uh, product. He's also done. Um, the icebreaker, is it Itsy or Bitsy? I know there was an Itsy Bitsy that was an ESP32, but he's either called it the icebreaker Itsy or the icebreaker Bitsy, which is just like a really small one, which just has the up 5K on it, uh, Spyram and Flash, and the USB is native into the up 5K into the ice 5K. Um, on the icebreaker, he uses an FTDI to talk to the um, flash, so we can program the flash, and to do USB to the ICE5K. So yeah, that's a great board, and it's all open source as well, uh, and really good community. Definitely worth it. He, he's on Twitch as well, if you want to watch his, his dreams. They're really good. He uses KiCad. Um, which isn't my cup of tea, but um, he streams a lot of his designing and development and stuff, so he's very cool. Now let me just get my CAD up. 
hopefully this won't completely hang everything given my luck this evening oh, i've got a wooden desk i'm touching it uh, okay let's get this out so what should we do first Delete the lock. Delete the lock. Hmm. Okay, it's brought it up. That's good. So, what should we do first? Let's have a look at the layout. I'm just going to switch. I'm going to make it sound very cool, like I know what I'm doing here. I'm going to switch scenes. Give me a sec. Um, I just want to get things set up as best I can. Uh, let me turn off some of this stuff so you can see what's going on. Okay, let me just turn all the layers off. Hold on. Let me talk about the layout. Right. Can you see that, guys? Mm, turn that on. Cool. So, um, I've had a nightmare trying to come up with names for this as well. Um, what I'm going with is the bit flip, but let's get back to that. Originally, this is based on something I was calling um, the Black Ice Ultra, but it departed so far from Black Ice that I kind of decided it needs another name. I've, I've used Black Ice for so long. Um, I'm not sure that this completely fits because it's represents a bit of a radical departure uh, one of the reasons that I wanted to have a kind of higher end and a lower end is to enable me to better target different audiences and this is very much targeting um, people coming into the market people that might not have even used FPGAs before um, there were by doing workshops, tutorials, and etc. over the years with Black Ice, I've got quite a good idea of what works and what doesn't. Uh, and one of the things that that means is narrowing in on particular paths and solutions. Um, not being so wide, but being much more focused uh, on the approach. Um, so I probably need to explain a bit more of my thinking, but let me just point out some things on the board first. Um, this here is the ESP32, so that's the 32S2. Um, to the right of it is a 3D antenna, um, which is lots of fun. And then below it, and connected directly to it, are a 64 megabyte SPI flash. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, a 2 megabyte uh, SPI. Sorry. A 64 megabyte SPI RAM and a 2 megabyte uh, SPI flash. Um, it uses a 40 megahertz oscillator as well, which is a bit higher than normal. I normally use like 20s and stuff on these boards. And then on the right hand side here, uh, we've got the up ice 45k. Um, the other important thing here is USB on the left, which we will use for programming, among other things. 
but if you look at the format carefully let me turn a few more layers on now that i've shown you what's what uh let's get some pads on let's take a look at some of the routing and stuff as well so i'm in the process of um getting the routing done on this so we've got usb and wi-fi both of which enable us to talk to it one network based one basically uh, as a usb serial but also potentially as a drive um, again this comes to how do we make it easier for people to get stuff in there um, We are going to do firmware. One of the reasons that I want to go with the ESP32 is it comes with a lot of goodies above and beyond the obvious hardware benefits of having um, Wi-Fi. It has some great internal features and some great software support. So um, one of the things that I wanted to make sure in order to support what I want on the software front, uh, it had to be able to support MicroPython. So the answer is yes, definitely MicroPython support. Um, I am also looking at uh, CircuitPython as well. Um, that's really interesting, um, particularly some of the things that Tim wants to do, who's one of the developers on CircuitPython at Adafruit, is very interesting. And I think I can probably help him with some of those things. Um, and I'll circle back around to that when I talk a bit more about the software. So most definitely, yes, MicroPython. Um, MicroPython itself and CircuitPython. Uh, CircuitPython is based on MicroPython. It just makes some development decisions that are slightly different. It's a bit more C, C Python oriented. Uh, it has a much more structured API approach, um, which works across different platforms, unlike MicroPython, which tends to optimize for individual platforms. Um, the good reason why you want to do that is because one of the things that I want people to be able to do is do the entire thing in Python. Um, we did experiment with development uh, on the Black Ice board some time ago with the Arduino environment. Yeah, there are some limitations with circuit Python. However, there are some interesting possibilities for solving those sorts of issues uh, with circuit Python. Not only that, um, if you look at the way that the expressive stuff is done with the S2 and their IDF they actually use uh, free RTOS underneath the circuit Python that's being developed on top of that will not use all of those facilities but there seems to be an indication that that's an area um, that they would like to take advantage of so there is there is scope there um, there is also
one 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 of the big advantages that you have it, it, if you develop embedded systems in C, for example, what throws a lot of people is having to deal with both the real time stuff and the non real time stuff. The requirements are very different for both things, and anyone working in the, the embedded space will um, will be familiar with this. It's it, it, it's a juggle trying to make all of those things work. Um, because when you do the real time code, the requirements are very different from when you do the other code. You know, uh, the real time requirements are lean, mean. The code isn't very structured. It's interrupt driven, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Whereas you know the higher level code that you need um, for doing the orchestration and the algorithmic stuff, if you like, um, what you want is good API, good abstractions, etc. Um, so those two don't mesh very well, and you you find yourself having to put two different hats on. And it's a bit of a problem. Uh, and certainly when you look at MicroPython and CircuitPython, um, they are great on the abstraction layer. CircuitPython is good with APIs as well, consistency. And it's very easy, very short learning curves. It's great to get in. It's brilliant for prototyping, super fast for prototyping. Uh, and of course, you've got C underneath as well, speeding things up because um, it's based on you know C Python effectively. However, when it comes to the real time stuff, clearly it's rubbish. I mean, you, you can do some of it in C underneath, um, but for real time, yeah, you, you, you haven't got something that's that predictable. Um, However, when you look at what I'm talking about here, if we look at what I'm calling BitFlip or what used to be Black Ice Ultra in my head for the project, one of the things that you can do is split those things up. You know, the one thing that the FPGA is super good at is real time. FPGAs just eat real time, you know. Doing real time in FPGAs is relatively simple. You know, it's not a bind like it is in C or in higher level programming languages. So you can quite easily partition a solution is one of the things that I'm thinking. So on one hand, you could use something like NMIGEN to do your real time design uh, and then use MicroPython and CircuitPython to do the orchestration. And that would kind of give you the best of both worlds. How you join those two together, however, is, is an open question. Um, but people are looking at that, uh, including myself. And I think it's an interesting area, and I think it can be done. The when you're designing the FPGA stuff in MMIGEN, you are designing within Python. So you've got a very familiar, very powerful uh, language and sets of libraries, really good abstractions. Um, however, that doesn't mean that you get away completely scot-free. You have to understand what you're trying to do underneath. But what you need to understand is relatively small compared to doing it in, say, VHDL or Verilog. Not only that, but it's quite easy to share NMIGEN libraries and piece things together so that you can just focus on uh, the bits that you need to do that are unique. Um, and having some good way of doing that will help. I believe. And being able to do it all from within Python would be pretty amazing. Um, you can also migrate functionality from one layer to the next, not automatically. 
but you know when you prototype you knock things up quickly and then you look at where you're going to optimize and you move stuff maybe from the orchestration layer down into the real time layer etc um spi works well on the esp32 to link micro python and the fpga yeah i mean that that there has to be something there has to be a good umbilical cord. Uh, on Black Edge, there is going to be an incredibly good umbilical cord. Um, but that's quite complex. What I'm doing with Bitflip is I'm using uh, something a bit simpler, but beyond SPI. So uh, let me just see if I can switch this circuit. I can quickly show you on this. Uh, you remember, Laurie, a while back we had uh, on the Black Ice, not the MX, the Black Ice 4, the one before we had a quad SPI link between the uh, M4, the STM32, L433 and the FPGA uh, and that originally that's what I was thinking of doing with this but then um, I was still a bit worried about latency among other things so um, let me just switch over see if I can bring up the circuit hold on uh, let me bring forward the schematic. Ding! As if by magic. <sighs> OBS takes some getting used to. Right, let's zoom in a bit. So, um, if we look at the FPGA. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the SPI, the normal SPI on the FPGA, i.e. for programming, then I'm overlapping the lower bits of the SPI from the ESP32 with those. So we've got to select the B in this case is bus select bus clock then bus data line zero but i go from data line zero one which is all i need for the programming but then when it runs the um uh the bus into it, the bus hdl uh rtl then that extends from zero one two three all the way up to seven so that gives me effectively um what's an octo what's i think stm call it octo spi um expressive don't don't use this <clears throat> naming convention um they just talk about two line four line and eight line so in expressive terms what we're talking about here is an eight line um so the umbilical between the ESP32 and the ICE 5K, the ICE Ultra Plus, is actually uh, an 8-bit. Um, I've got an additional um, signal called BQS, which I can use for strobing the data if I want to include dummy cycles in the transfer. Uh, I could also use it the other way potentially as a um, stop sending or start sending. Um, but theoretically what it means is I have an 8-bit, i.e. a byte, not nibble, but a byte interface between the two, which can be clocked. You can DDR it at 40 megahertz or SDR it single. Uh, at 80 megahertz gives you the same throughput whichever one you choose 
um, and that limitation is down to the ESP32 interface. But that means you can effectively send uh, 80 megabytes per sec. So it's fairly uh, high bandwidth um, between the two devices. In fact, it may seem like overkill, but really, although the megabytes may be a little high, the key benefit here is the latency because it means I can transfer a byte um, theoretically in a single clock cycle. That's not completely true uh, because I'm, we're unlikely to be using it in a way that means we're only ever transferring a single byte. Um, so for example, say we had an application like um, maybe the FPGA was the display and you were building, designing yourself a, you know, a GPU and then the FPGA connector and the VGA connector or something, for example. In which case you'd want to use the internal SRAM, etc. that's inside the 5K. So what you could effectively do is build a relatively simple bus interface that took that eight uh, eight lane bus and enabled you to you know use a simple addressing protocol uh, like a 16-bit address protocol for example which would send two uh, two bytes as a start address and then it could burst the data you know you could send basically a start address the number of bytes you're going to send and then burst the rest of the data really rapidly and have the FPGA bang that straight into its SRAM, use a dual port design uh, for that SRAM, and then have the FPGA, you know, buffering that out over the VGA. Um, so it would give us a lot of versatility in that area. One of the other things that I should mention, if we look at this, if we look at the pins, so we look on the left hand side of the ICE 5K here, I've got a H-Sync, then I've got a C data 0, that's camera data 0, and camera data 7. So there's an 8-bit, an X-Clock, and P-Clock, and V-Sync. So we can interface directly to the OVR cameras, like uh, the 2700s, for example. Um, have those hooked directly into the um, FPGA and then we can use the bus in the opposite direction you know we can buffer and manipulate the video in real time using the DSPs in there and the internal RAM and have that buffered out to the USB 32 saving it to, to do all the legroom so it could be resized whatever machine learning you know I know Lattice are really into that on their low low power platforms um, so you can do it the other way around as well with that kind of bus interface you've got enough bandwidth between the two devices to move that stuff and that enables the FPGA to concentrate on doing the stuff really fast rather than stealing the cycles from the orchestration level layer sorry running on on the ESP32 perhaps in Python so that gives us some good opportunities so what's Laurie's question? Will the ESP32 access the SD card directly? Yeah, there's a gotcha here. This this wound me up a little bit. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, the SD card is connected directly to the ESP32 on this board. Annoyingly, the ESP32 does not have an SD card peripheral the original ESP32 did the ESP32 S does not S2 does not have this um, so it's just SPI but that's more really for logging and slow offloading however um, okay don't worry Ed, it's not a problem 
It's already been a success. It's working compared to what it was. <laughs> I appreciate your, uh, your, your turning up. Uh, I'm not sure which day we're going to do it next either. We'll return to that. I might do it on a Wednesday or I might continue to do it on a Friday. We'll have to see. Um, but thanks for dropping in anyhow. Um, the FPGA, it, it's relatively easy for us to add an SD card to the FPGA if required. But for now, I've just hooked one onto the ESP32 because it's easy to do so. And it's on the right side of the board. Um, one of the other things that you notice about the layout, so the, 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 the camera connector and SD card are very difficult to see on the CAD. Let me just switch back. I'll just show you where these are. Do, 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 do. Um, let me turn the other layers off and you can see underneath. Bing, bing, bing. Fly. Yeah, so if you look underneath, um, here's the SD card at the front, which is kind of under the USB, pointing that way, which is the way it needs to be really for convenience. And then there's the FPC connector for the camera here. There are the conductors on the bottom and there's the, uh, the header. Right, so both of those are on the bottom. Also, there's a pin header on the bottom as well, a surface mount. But that's actually a, a 0.1 inch header, but it's just surface mount. That has FPGA pins on it, among others. Let me just bring this back on so you can see the whole thing, just so you know where that is. Uh, Um, the the some of the pins are exposed here on a P mod connector, uh, so you can do a simple P mod connection, um, which is quite handy. Um, there's another eight pins that come through on that connector I pointed out on the bottom header. Plus this pin here is also an FPGA pin. The other pins are uh, the ESP32 pins. And the layout of this is actually um, a feather layout. So it's compatible with the feather. So you can actually put this into feather wings, etc., and use all the feather goodies, which again, is kind of appealing, I think, to uh, a lot of the people that are likely to be interested in this. Um, and it's a very small form factor. Uh, to give you an idea, it's kind of, I don't know if you've had a feather, I don't have one handy, but um, so if you look at the P mod, the old. P mod proto it's a little bit bigger than that so it's actually a really small teeny tiny board shame I haven't got a banana to compare it to teeny teeny tiny that's kind of dimension so it's a very small board So, but it's it's got some fairly packed in features. Um, you know, the camera stuff is useful. That seems to be very, very popular now. Um, plus you've got Wi-Fi accessory as well as USB and all the other bits and mobs. So I think it's got a very good list. Um, one of the key differences well, I have Greg Davis. All oh, right. Wow. Yeah. 
That is a serious feather board. How much memory does it have? It has like a giga, gigabyte of DRAM, doesn't it? Or something, DDRM? It's like seriously loaded. It's also about $120, if I remember right. 128 megabit. No, it's more than that, isn't it? Well, maybe I'm thinking of his buffer stick. Sure, it's not megabyte. Yeah. Anyhow, it is seriously endowed. and <laughs> comes with a price tag uh, to boot. I think he's really taking the feather form factor somewhere. Like, you know, he's probably taking it to Jupiter and I'm just aiming for maybe Mars or the moon. <laughs> um, it does look really cool. I was watching his stream earlier. Did you watch his stream? God, talk about a marathon. I didn't watch all of it. I watched bits. He was building his um, butter stick. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's on Twitch, I think, as well. But he has the whole thing. It's like a six-hour marathon, and he builds a complete, two complete butter sticks from scratch, populates them, um, and there's a lot of components on them. Um, very cool. The guy's a, you know, he's a machine. Okay. Cheers, cheers Ed. Thanks for dropping by. We will see you next time or on the forum. Enjoy your weekend. Um, so this is really the bit flip, which I've got to work on this name as well. I'm not entirely sure that I should call it that, but it's just one idea at the moment. But um, it's aiming at a very different market and it enables me to do other things. So one, one of the things that I will probably do with this is have um, a kind of carrier board that supports Feather and also supports the extra, um, the extra connectors. So for example, rather than having the P mod here, you could have direct connectors down into the board. That way all the FPGA pins apart from the bus get exposed um, onto effectively a carrier board uh, and I've got a whole bunch of projects that I want to do with this that this is more than capable of doing including things like motion controllers etc so it'd be a good platform to uh, prove this approach on because I'm going to be doing quite a bit more software on this than we did on black ice um, I very much believe that uh, getting the right software is critical to making these work. Um, in terms of name, at the moment I'm hedging for bit flip, <laughs> but I did toy with bit flit as well. But that could well change. I'm very interested in any ideas on that front. As I said, I didn't want to use the black ice moniker really because it's a bit different from that, um, particularly when it comes to the software layer. VGA would be fairly easy. So I'd probably have a daughter board that this plugs into that has a VGA connector on it. And on that board will probably be a couple of USB A's that support the old PS2 mode or low speed USB bit banged through the FPGA um, maybe some game controllers type connectors you know the DV9s or the uh, plastic equivalent the stuff that works well with the retro games basically also maybe an SD card potentially right so the ESP32 has a 64 megabyte SPI, quad SPI flash. The FPGA doesn't. The FPGA just has what it's, you know, endowed with from factory. 
Um, let's talk about the ESP32 bit a little bit because that's interesting. Um, the ESP32 S2 is probably better than the original ESP32 in this regard. So they've lent in the past quite a lot on using external quad SPI flash and quad SPI um, RAM. On the original modules, they shipped two megabytes, I think. Uh, most of those chips you can't get actually now, the quad SPI ones, but you can get the 64. Um, so I'd put the 64 on there. That gives it quite a lot of extra RAM. Now, obviously, because it's quad SPI, that's not the same as using internal RAM. Internally, spec-wise, I think it has about 320K, which is quite generous. Um, but, was it 320K? I forget. But anyhow, it has, um, you can split, it has a cache. It has in separate instruction and separate data caches, which on the original SP, ESP32, you had a, um, a cache that was responsible for both the instructions and data, which wasn't so good. So the S2 is much better in that regard. So there, there is some internal speed up. Um, so the quad SPI isn't quite as bad as it seems uh, in many regards. Having that cache uh, is useful. Not only that, the internal last RAM can be partitioned so you can extend the cache and use a, a smaller, uh, the smaller one of the two SRAM selections to act as a, another cache, which is really useful. And that speeds stuff up a lot, particularly on an orchestration type layer. Um, so it's pretty well endowed, but in a uh, slightly unconventional way. Um, but they've always heavily relied on external QSPI flash and RAM expressive. They've kind of pioneered it really, and the evolution of their support for that has improved, particularly with the caching and everything else. It's actually quite reasonable. Um, so that's probably the best place for that to be. I mean, I did think about putting things like RAM on the FPGA, but the trouble is, uh, with the 5K, it's only a QFN 49. The pins just aren't there to attach anything, you know, particularly fast. Yes, you could potentially do like a Hyper RAM, maybe. then you're going to be left with very few pins, frankly. So um, that's really the story with the um, memory. Um, it's, you know, this isn't Black Edge. You know, it's not an X core. This is something, you know, somewhat lower powered than that. And it's aimed at a different place in that regard. How long are we going? Have it checked. One hour sixteen already, my goodness, what is the time? I'm just going to set it right. Um Yeah, doing HDMI would be tricky. You can do a single PMOD HDMI. I seem to recall there is a PMOD HDMI that uses a single PMOD. You could do it on the motherboard a bit more easily if you wanted it wider. Um, I don't think you could bit bang it. I think you have to rely on external um chip 
that you can bang a lot of data to. I may be proved wrong, someone will probably find a way of doing it. Um, that will be easier on Black Edge and in particular on the um, next core which will have a direct HDMI connector on it anyhow. Probably the mini HDMI. But it worked this time. <laughs> the will be correct. Very important. Oh, let, before I forget, um, I'm not used to using HDMI on the ULX3. That's nice, both of them, yeah. So, do you use the quad P mod HDMI extension extender board that he makes on the icebreaker? Sorry. I mean, the ULX3 is different, that's got a native or direct HDMI connector and the ECP5 is fast enough to drive that. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't really be aiming this at HDMI, but there is a way to do it. Let me, uh, right, I'm just going to bring up Chrome. It's probably going to wreck everything. Hold on. Probably got a billion tabs open. Just trying to remember what's it called? Uh, one bit squared. Let me just see. I'm pretty sure Peter has a couple of HDMI. There's a digital video interface, which is the kind of quad P mod. I can't see the single one. Where did I see the single one? Maybe it wasn't um, one of Peter's. Hmm. Doesn't seem to be listed on his site. The single PMOD one. I notice he's selling the orange crab as well now. Um. Mm -hmm. HDMI PMOD. Let me just do a quick Google. There you go. Uh, that's Dan O'Shee's, that's a direct one. Um, did Digilent have one? Per chance? Um, there is a chip, I believe, that does low bit depth, color bit depth. Let's see, hold on. <laughs> right. Hmm. Damn it. Just didn't have these in some sort of order. I think I might have to do a search for that. Sorry. Can't seem to find it. Hmm, Google doesn't seem to be bringing anything up. I'm pretty sure I've seen one on a, you know, a, what they call a double P mod, i.e. Uh, an 8, eight GPIO P mod, but it's limited in terms of its color depth. You cannot see it. 
I don't know where that is. I'll have to look that one up because it will be a useful one. Uh, which am I? Oh, that one I can't find the beer now. No, that's Black Mesa. If I look at the original crowd supply. Yeah, if you look at the original crowd supply, um, in the picture there of all the P mods, if you scroll down the page, in fact, if you look at this JPEG, you can actually see it in the picture. At about half past one, <laughs> between one and two o'clock. That's a double P mod or single P mod. Right, okay. So it's that one anyhow. So if you look at that image, it's, uh, you know, on the clock, it's about half past one. So it's certainly possible to go that route. Or you could do it on the motherboard. However, what you've got to be careful of is the number of pins you're using because um, <laughs> Lily strangled myself with the headphone cables getting caught up on the wheels of my chair unbelievable so it's certainly possible to go that route I don't know why it's not listed on this site. Maybe you didn't sell many. Maybe everyone buys the double one. Anyhow, it's possible to go down that route if um, the HDMI is important. EGA is still really popular as well, of course, and that's easy enough to do. There are lots of people who use LCDs as well, which is an even easier way to do it. Lots of people seem to use LCD projects now. But yeah, for the retro stuff, um, slightly different. However, I must say, I'm not really pointing this at the retro direction. Uh, Black Edge would be is great for that because it has all the um, built-in stuff that you need. Um, so I've got to finish routing the. Um, this board fairly shortly. Not got much left to do on it, but uh, I need to optimize it somewhat because there's a bit too much breakage in terms of the um, power planes in the center. I'm going to clean those up a bit. It's really aimed at um, folks coming to the FPGA for the first time, to be fair. People that may have done some microcontroller stuff that are interested in um, getting onto the FPGA. 
um, ladder, so to speak. That on route, that you know, on ramp. I'm going to try and um, try and get that as shallow as possibly. Um, I think the key to that will be Edmogen really and the combination of using Python orchestration running on the extensor core on the ESP32 and lots of Edmogen libraries help people get up and running um, on the FPGA side and then probably some good on ramps to doing the basics I think there will have to be an interesting way of doing the the way that you have the communication between the ESP32 and the FPGA side of things or in this case between the output of the NMIGEN, if you like, that describes the hardware, that models the hardware, and the micro Python slash circuit Python that's running on the ESP32. Now, what I think we can do is we can combine those so we can create devices. That, de that describe both the hardware, the description, using NMIGEN. So in other words, we could have a, a Python class that describes the NMIGEN and submodules. That class could also contain the interface for micro Python or circuit Python using perhaps two different types of um, APIs yes I'd say it hardly got started um, to be fair Laurie Laurie's saying here that the um, the software was very patchy on the black ice and it was it was really the uh, my storm software was really just about loading the binaries and flash etc it didn't really go much beyond it there was some Arduino code that made it easier to interface but this is going to be entirely different there's going to be a lot more software here uh, the key will be developing this kind of Python layer that enables you to connect the two to describe both the hardware and deal with the interfacing. Underneath there will effectively be uh, like a, a standardization of the bus inside the FPGA that uses the uh, eight lane or byte interface from the ESP uh, to and from, to and fro to the ESP32 yeah I mean basically what you're trying to do is wrap the NMIGEN so in the case of circuit Python in some ways it's a bit easier because you have very um, very standardized conventions and APIs already in uh, circuit Python probably more so than micro Python um, so not only are you leveraging all of those but you are effectively you can recreate any of those existing ones if you so wish if that was SPI for example you could recreate SPI running on the FPGA that had this layer in between using the 8-bit bus uh, you could even memory map it that's not difficult to do 
um, so that the eight line spy actually got memory mapped directly into the SP ESP32 their spy hardware not only supports that but it's also capable of caching it in fact you have to be a bit careful to avoid that because it's kind of volatile you know if you're talking about registers inside the FPGA um, you probably wouldn't want the caching to happen but if you're uh, the cases I'm thinking are more like rather than just direct register addressing although that will be relatively easy to do I also want to have streaming APIs uh, and effectively what these are doing so th this isn't a case of I'm running Python say on the ESP32 at the orchestration layer which is writing to registers that have been designed in nmigen whose address is generated by nmigen automatically on the bus um, so that's a nice simple way of doing it and you'll be familiar with this Laurie seeing this on the SOC type approaches for things like Litex and you know spinal HDL etc and the, the uh, Murata socks but actually going beyond that and having streaming interfaces now the way that the streaming interfaces would work is the interfaces that you're using um, because you are I mean if it was something like a camera interface for example that was a streaming interface you'd be doing uh, clock domain crossing so if you know you'd use the old trick of using FIFOs in between so your streaming interface will be based around those FIFOs um, but there will be a standard way of doing those FIFOs across the bus um, and you'd effectively be allocating internal FPGA SRAM as those FIFO buffers and then the bus itself would be effectively um, buffering those backwards and forwards from the ESP32 so yes we can do the register type approach and we certainly want to do that but it would also be nice to have this alternative kind of streaming interface even for streaming data in from say a camera or the data processed from a camera uh, that's being written to a FIFO inside the FPGA and then buffered out through the bus to the ESP32 or the other way around you know if you were imagining it was a um, uh, you know some sort of buffer for a LCD output you know um, that may have a kind of GPU part that did the bit blittings and all that kind of stuff inside the FPGA but the raw data stuff the movement of sprites and stuff could be buffered to and from um, and in things like a motion control scenario which is one of the ones that I've been thinking about then your motion primitives will be buffered by a streaming interface but the actual motion uh, low-level commands you know driving say a brushless motor set of brushless axes um, will be done by the FPGA um, you can think of it as a motion accelerator inside the FPGA um, so the peripherals that you could build that would then be automatically hooked into micro Python or circuit Python would be a bit more sophisticated than just registers that you're talking to. You could have, you know, effectively buffered FIFOs that provide streaming uh, primitives and abstractions. And I think that would be powerful that enables a different kind of um, separation of concerns between the orchestration layer and the FPGA layer uh, and getting those libraries is, will, will be critical I think to its success and I'm chomping at the bit to do it but I can't do it until I've got all the pieces of hardware in place course I mean I'm trying to do something with the dev kits but it's a bit limited um, 
but it enables me to try out some other stuff. Um, but I can't do it all myself. There will be, you know, we'll need to build a community on this. Luckily, by hooking into MicroPython and perhaps CircuitPython, um, there's already a lot of good stuff out there. And some of the people I've been speaking to want to extend that and make it more performant. Um, in conjunction with using FPGAs and integrating the FPGA design cycles in there. And MMIGen has some good wrappers on that stuff. Not only can, can you describe it um, in a way that can be synthesized in the FPGA, it has a simulation built in, your test benches, etc. really easy to operate from um, outputs to GDK, you know, your, your WAV files, etc. really easy. But it also has support um, for the um, formal stuff as well, which is really nice. Um, that's one of the cool things with the end margin stuff is you can actually use the formal stuff from within Python, which kind of is a new interesting angle. But that's a lot to take in for, you know, perhaps. Uh, people new to the FPGA side, but um, its integration is really rather convenient with Enmigen, to be quite honest. That's why I like Enmigen, uh, and why I've decided to use that primarily as a development platform as opposed to Enmigen. Um, the other thing is, I'm not really gunning for systems on a chip. Um, yeah, sure, you could design your processor in there as well. But in many of these models, the processing is actually going to run a lot faster on the ESP32 than it's ever going to run inside the uh, 5K, nice 45K. However, in some cases, it's useful to have that kind of real-time processor, if you like, uh, running in the um, FPGA, and you can still do that. It's not difficult. However, you, you need to compile code for that, really. You don't really want to be running the Python stuff on that MicroPython. So it's going to struggle at, you know, the kind of speeds that you're going to get out of a, an FPGA. You know, I don't know what, even for the... Uh, you know, the RISC V stuff that we've seen. I don't think that's going to be running awfully fast on the um, ISO Ultra Plus 5K. It's going to be severely limited. I think when we get to the Certus, you know, the latter Certus stuff, then it's going to be different. It's going to be a bit faster. But on the ISO 5K, you're going to be... You probably want to have most of the von Neumann type processing uh, on the ESP32 with respect to the fact that it's hard in architecture. Um, time scale for the board, Laurie. I need to get these out as soon as possible. Um, I've not got much more to, root, to do routing wise. What you're looking at there on the CAD is several generations down already. Um, I was going to order the finished route and get the boards ordered next week, actually. Um, I've been talking to Toby, and we were going to try and get them made end of September, October, maybe sooner. What I will probably do is I'm going to make maybe one or two first next couple of weeks then i was going to make you know a few tens of them to give to um, certain interested parties or people that wanted to buy in early i won't make any more than 50. drive me mad making any more than those 
and then do the manufacture straight after that. Um, primary reason for that is just wanting to get some of this software proven before we commit to making hundreds of them, which is what I need, you know, to get Toby involved. Um, he's sitting ready to do that now. He's back engaged doing all that stuff. So he's, he's keen to get some of these made as well. So I've got that queued up. And then after that, it will be Black Edge queued up for him as well. Um, I've got a whole crap load of memory sitting in Shenzhen. Uh, waiting for the Black Edge stuff as well. I thought you might be, Laurie. You'll, you'll be high on my list. Um, but yeah, I wanted to get this out. This, one of the reasons I wanted to do this before Black Edge, apart from the fact that I've had some issues with Black Edge and some changes in the way that I wanted to do it, is this will be an interesting test, this board. Um, because I am purposely pushing a certain model, um, a certain architecture. Uh, whereas Black Ice was kind of anything to anyone, this is much more confined and narrowed and focused. As I say, you know, with the orchestration and most of co-running on the ESP32 and the FPGA just doing clever bit stuff, you know, stuff that you can't easily do on microcontrollers and the real-time stuff that you have trouble doing in Python. So it's a fairly specific model I'm targeting here. Yes, you can do the other stuff as well, but that's what I'm targeting with this. So it's going to be an interesting proof of what you can do with that model, you know, on some fairly modest hardware, really. Um, I'm also trying to get some pricing on the ice parts at the moment. That's taking me longer. I mean, I'm, I'm fine for the first, you know, for the ones I'm making here in the UK, the early ones. I've already got the stuff for that. Um, but for the big, big run, big manufacturer, I'm still trying to get decent pricing. That's fairly critical because that will effectively set the final price. And the final price I want to be obviously lower than where Black Ice was, you know, for this to be competitive uh, and for it to be, uh, you know, reasonable on ramp people getting into it. So that's currently the status. Uh, one thing I was going to, uh, I'm not going to have time to deal with the CAD today because I'm going to run out, but um, one thing I was going to show you, I wonder if I can open now, you asked about the HDMI. One of the things that I did design but haven't yet proven for the black ice. I better show that briefly. I wonder if I can. I wonder if I can find this. So one of the things I was thinking of doing the stream is um, the graveyard feature. I spent so much time designing stuff and then for whatever reason I'm not happy with it or I don't go through with it or I don't make many. Um, I have so many of these different things so I, I figure it might be quite fun to show some of them. But on this HDMI thing I did come up with an interesting uh, board. Um, I've just got to try and remember where the hell I put it. Bear with me. I think it's on this system. Hold on.
Look at the dates on here. There you go. So this was one of the things that I was looking at as an option for the black ice boards. Uh, let me make sure the colours I've used on here. So what this was, rather than using the Black Ice MX uh, carrier, this was an alternative carrier um, that I was interested in building that I kind of put to one side and haven't tested. So what this had on it was, rather than having the um, free mix mods, it just had the two good ones because the third one was always uh, slightly compromised by the SD card among other things and then with the rest of the pins one of the things I did was I took the HDMI signal from the mini which is also connected to the black edge port on the top eight bits here so I pull that out onto a full you know a larger HDMI connector here um, the surface mount one and then I also uh, added two USB A's um, which could be bit banged from the black ice either in a kind of PS2 mode or a low speed you know like 1 1.1 1. 1. Um, great for kind of gaming really but I haven't actually made any yet but it's still there as a possibility um, so it's an interesting one if people are interested I could certainly put a few of these together because it's already designed just haven't made the damn thing and I've got most of the bits so I don't have to HMI connectors strangely but um, so that was a kind of alternative to the black ice MX board that solved the theoretically of the HDMI problem or the mini HDMI problem. Um, so I know you were asking about that earlier. Sorry. So it's one of the ones that sits in what I call my graveyard. <laughs> I've got a host of designs that never saw the light of day for one reason or another. Um, Because these things cost money to make, you know. It's very difficult to make small quantities of things. It's much easier to make large quantities. It's easy to make one offs, two offs, but if you want to make just fifty or something, that's quite difficult. Uh, you have to do it yourself, which is extremely time consuming. Yeah, no, I've, I've seen some of the stuff on the UX3. I mean, I've been somewhat tied up the last month or so, but uh, yeah, I've seen how busy that is and how hard you've been working down there. Have you, um, are there any new developments on the um, spinal HCL side and on the SOC side? Have things matured a bit more on the SOC side with the VEX risk? Or is it Marat? Marata? I can't remember what it's called, the SOC. Or it was Saxon Sock and then Marata or Marat. I can't remember what it's called. Remind me, Nori. Spinal HCR now does. Oh, symmetrical multiprocessing. Wow. Murex, that was it. Thank you. So I forgot the name. Oh, Murex was the old one. Okay. So I am getting them mixed up chronologically. Okay. Um, whilst I'm here, the other thing that I did uh, 
let me see if I can actually show you. So this isn't this is something that I did actually put together as well in the end. I mean this is attached to something else, but uh, let me see if I can get back to the full camera. So that was something else I did, which was a carrier, um, which I thought would be interesting for the um, educational market. This one, I'm sitting on top of a breadboard, so I'm using it to prototype some stepper drivers, amongst other things. But um, so here, I'm trying to get it to focus. The lighting is messing with the autofocus here. If I put it in front of my face maybe but then I can't see the camera maybe I'll get a lock on it so you've got the ice core sitting on it there and then the rest is the door support so it had the um, seven segment and built-in VGA connector an audio connector etc that was kind of designed and that also you can't see it on this version but I also added the USB A's onto it as well um, so that was kind of interesting um, project there we go finally it focused crikey that didn't take very long at all so that was kind of cool Yeah, I noticed they're using Vex Risk pretty much as a go to Risk 5 core for kind of microcontroller type size and or retro purposes. It's um, clearly the most efficient thing. I haven't seen something, it's, fu it's funny that it's actually designed in spinal. I haven't seen anything that's kind of competitive really in um, in any of the other um, other languages that will output the HDL. I don't think I've seen anything faster in my gen. Haven't looked at Miranda yet, heard of it. I don't know what the performance is like. But it's probably early days as well. Haven't had chance to run any benchmarks on any of that stuff yet. But there's no reason why they couldn't um, produce something as functional and nippy. Thank you. Kay Temkin. Is that the USB stuff you're talking about? Kate's USB stuff. Yeah. Yeah, Kate's work is um, brilliant. Really good. And she's got support for the um, what used to be the SMC. USB 3.3, which is based on the, ooh, is it UTMI, ULTMI? It's the parallel 8-bit interface, physical interface. It will do 480. I, I, I want to use that on the um, Black Edge boards. Um, I either, you know, the, what do they call it? Is it the high-speed USB? USB 2 
rather than the full speed. So it's 480 megabits, 50 or 50 to 60 megabytes per second, USB 2. Uh, so that's supported in Kate's, Kate's code, not just the bit dang stuff, but that as well. In fact, I think, um, sure, Greg, they will mention that. I think he was using that on on his butter stick ECP5 design. I think he uh, includes ESMC, USB, what is it, 3000, 3XXXX chip, I can't remember what it is, the exact model. It's now owned by um, Microchip. They bought out SMC some time ago. No, but it's probably early days. Uh, and I don't know what the design goal of Miranda is at this point. What's it trying to be? Is it trying to be a generic one or is it trying to be a fast, fast core, etc.? I mean, there's nothing stopping you looking at something like the Vex Risk and thinking, hmm, recreating something of those kind of performance characteristics in M margin, potentially. If you're good at that stuff, it's not my, it's not my bag, obviously, but there are people that just love designing cores. Um, Go back. Where was I? Bit flip. Let me know if you have any good good ideas for names for this. How are we doing for time? So I have now been streaming for nearly two hours. Uh, two hours will do it for the first one. I'm still not sure on days. I was thinking of maybe doing it on a Wednesday, Wednesday evening. I think evenings are better than the daytime. What do you think? Right. Yeah, It's kind of my feeling. It's more difficult from a kind of lighting point of view. However, I am now seeing a lot more than I was earlier today, having replaced all of the LED lights. Even though they say, oh yes, these will last you for, you know, 10 years. What they don't explain is that they will <laughs> dim quite rapidly and you won't notice until you're almost sitting in darkness, which was what I was doing until I got the new ones put in. So it's actually light enough now. I don't just fade into the darkness, which is cool. It's also much easier to work in in the evening. You can actually see some stuff, which is helpful. I think what I'll probably do, Laurie, is I'll probably try doing next Wednesday uh, and we start seeing, you know, I start telling people that I'm streaming, start tweeting about it and stuff like that. Now that I'm more confident that it does actually, my setup here is actually working just about. Uh, 
and hopefully we don't have the issues like we did at the start with sad bit rates I can't believe I was getting that crappy bit rate at the beginning uh, I don't know probably more on uh, bit flip I think that's going to be the primary thing depending on how I get on uh, I'm hoping by Wednesday to have finished the routing on this but there's no guarantee I may get interrupted between now and then I don't know how much I'm going to get done this weekend that's a variable um, my daughter is hustling me she's got a driving test book soon she wants me to take her out some more we just she just bought a new car an old car she needs me to take her out a bit so I've got quite a bit on that to do as well but I'll see how I get on so there may still be some hardware bits or it may just be a review of what I changed and did before getting this off routed and ordered um, if there isn't much of that then I may start touching base on some of the software uh, maybe look at um, programming the ice 40 from the expressive bit of code perhaps uh, that kind of stuff we just have to see how we get on really anyhow I'm gonna call it a day now much appreciated for joining uh, and getting me over my initial um, stream issues Hopefully it'll go much smoother from the start on Wednesday. But anyhow, thank you for paying attention. I hope I haven't completely bored everyone and anyone that's viewing this subsequently. Um, hopefully you won't have um, caught with the rubbish stuff at the beginning. Where we couldn't get the transfer rate. Um, but I look forward to seeing everyone talk a bit more about um i don't know what to call it we used to call it black eyes ultra but now we're really calling it bit flip let's see if someone comes up with a better name um and i'll see you guys um next wednesday have a great weekend bye